Hussein, in Islamic philosophy, how do we look at both judgment and eternal life? Let's start with judgment. What happens? First of all, we have to have a posthumous existence in order to be judged. So the two go together. Uh, let me start with judgment first of all in this world. By virtue of we being free beings, that is therefore responsible f morally for our actions because we are not determined no matter what behaviorists or ancient materialists or anybody else says, we are really free beings, free agents, and we have an immediate intuition of this freedom. Therefore, we are responsible for how we act. And judgment by God in Islamic thought involves, first of all, a life in this world. God judges what we do, and this Islam shares with Judaism and Christianity, and especially the Jewish tradition is very strong in bringing out the majesty the divine reality and what it means really to be judged by God in a remarkably majestic way. Uh, however, according to Islam, again, like other all religions of the world which have spoken about eschatology, some religions like Confucianism has not said very much about it, but all those religions that have, including the Abrahamic religions, uh, man has a posthumous reality. That is, man's soul does not die with physical death. And what the soul means, it's layers and levels and its relation to the higher soul and the spirit. I will not get into that now. But what defines us as us survives our physical existence in this world. And what we take with us into the other world is the fruit of our actions. Because our actions affect how we exist, the mode of our existence. And is that which we take with us. And eschatologically, we're judged by God on what we call a day of judgment, which again is very similar in all the three monotheistic religions. Judaism developed this doctrine later in the Talmud. It's not in the Torah, but it's in the Talmud. And Christianity and Islam goes back to their sacred scripture. We are judged by God according to how we made use of that free will. And on the basis of both the teachings he had given us throughout religion, and our capabilities. Uh, but the question of judgment by God is always combined with the aspect of mercy, that is the possibility of forgiveness by God. Uh, we cannot predetermine God's judgment. There are self-righteous people in all religions who try to do that. <laughs> but that is really a, an insult to God. I cannot say, now you will go to hell, or God forbid, you will go to heaven. Uh, that is really an insult to God. And the Quran is very, very strong on that. Although, like the Old Testament, it oftentimes uh, emphasizes, the, as I said, the tremendous, in the original Latin said, tremendum, reality that we face after death, and, the, and what the pains of what we call hell and the infernal states, it also always speaks about the divine mercy. What is the nature of hell in the Islamic tradition? Uh, our imaginations do not have the capability of directly imagining other worlds. Intellectually, we can gain access, let's say, to mathematical intelligibility. But our imagination is not strong enough. So all religions, when they speak about the other world, speak in a symbolic language. And uh, symbolically, hell in Islam is not that different from what you find in Judaism and Christianity. First of all, the torment of fire. Hell is always identified with fire. The very word hell in English in Greek means light. It's the negative aspect <laughs> of light, hell. Uh, like in German also, uh, and, uh, the word Hellenic and Hellenistic means the, coming from the land of light. In Arabic also, it's very interesting, the word for light is nur, the word for fire is nar, hmm. N-A-R-N-U-R, okay. again showing their uh, interrelatedness. So the idea of the pain of fire, F fire turns into cinders. At the same time, it transforms, it, trans it transmutes us. It's an alchemy plays such an important role, uh, which is also another symbolic way of speaking about transformation of the soul and other forms of torment. 
But the highest pain, which Islam emphasizes like Dante did in the Divine Comedy, is separation from God. Hell is separation from God. Because in this world, we do not see the beauty of God. So we don't care whether we're separate or not. But how horrible it is to see what we're really separated from. Is there a possibility in Islamic philosophy uh, in post-mortem to make progress? Or is death a final judgment? Or can there be um, improvement f f at whatever state you happen to be in at that time? I have to make a little comment on this to make this question clearer for those in, who understand the various nuances, the various forms of Islamic thought. For Kalam, or Islamic theology, uh, these no post posthumous states of transformation, which would already correspond to purgatory, do not play a role. In some schools, they're not mentioned at all, and some there are. But in later Islamic philosophy, they, they play a very important role. That is, we have a journey after death as we oh. had in this life. Oh. It's not that black and white, uh, in fact, there's a possibility of transformation after death. Yes. So those are two very different ways to approach it because one doesn't feel very good about however some sins people may do, if it's a finite number of years of sinning, 50 or 60 or 70 years, but to be punished forever for that, that's right. doesn't strike us normally as, as uh, too happy. In Islamic thought, the great philosophers and mystics who even came out and said daringly that the fires of hell are not eternal, oh. for which a lot of ordinary people castigated them, and of course, they said, what are you we're talking about? They understood that this stark opposition, contrast, which you see in the Abrahamic world between heaven and hell, are a very powerful way of guiding us morally in this life. Oh. They're not meant to be metaphysical and philosophical explanations of the posthumous states. Oh. So in Christianity, there are allusions here and there. Allusions here and there. In Islam, there's a full development of flowering, which is very similar to the Tibetan Book of the Dead or Hindu doctrines of the afterlife. You know, the Asian religions have developed very, very extensively these ideas. There are aspects of Islamic philosophy which are very similar to them. But the gist of it is that our development, you might say, in the deeper sense of the term, does not stop with death. Something stops, but the soul continues to develop and to become.